It's The Real News, and I am Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The biggest merger in the history of the Israeli arms industry took place when Abit Systems bought Israeli military industries known as IMI from the government of Israel. IMI is also Israel's oldest weapons company. It was established in 1933, even before the existence of the State of Israel. Albeit system paid about $600 million, and a quarter of that amount it will receive in a loan. Back in 1995, the U.S. arms company Lockheed Martin tried to buy IMI, and the Israeli government had refused, claiming that IMI is a strategic asset which the state of Israel cannot sell. Well, less than 20 years later, in 2013, the Israeli government took the decision to privatize IMI and for the last five years tried desperately to find a buyer and spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to make IMI more attractive. Nevertheless, Albeit Systems was the only bidder for IMI. On to talk about this move with me is Shia Heber. Shia is a Real News correspondent in Heidelberg, Germany. His recent book, The Privatization of Israeli Security, it was published by Pluto Press back in 2017. Shia, good to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Charmini. All right, Shir, tell us the mechanics of all of this. If the Israeli government had refused to sell IMI to Lockheed Martin back in 1995, why did it change its mind and why is uh, privatization so urgent for the Israeli government? Uh, there was a generational change in Israel and the old guard of the uh, generals, the top military brass, are not as powerful in Israel today as they used to be. Uh, neoliberal uh, economists and, and members of the government come, come up with this idea that any kind of publicly owned government is a bad idea. Any uh, public, public asset is a losing asset. And uh, I think the, the managers of IMI uh, got, the, got the idea very well. They realized that if they manage the company uh, poorly and drive it down to the ground, they will be rewarded by their future employer. So uh, now that um, Airbit Systems is buying IMI, the managers of IMI can expect uh, a raise uh, from their new employer because uh, they made IMI into a kind of toxic asset, uh, accumulating a lot of debt uh, on the company. And, and the way that the Israeli government uh, has uh, been talking about uh, IMI as, as a, something extremely unwanted, as a very badly managed company with heavy debt, uh, as, as really... Um, uh, convinced politicians that it would be a popular move to sell the company. Right. Um, off the top, I said that it took almost five years of efforts by the Ministry of Finance to actually sell uh, IMI. Why did it take so long? As soon as the Ministry of Finance came out with a statement saying that IMI is a, a losing company, they scared off a lot of potential buyers. They actually marked down their own assets and, and made sure that they're not gonna get very good bids for it. And then started the sort of race to the bottom. On the one side, the Israeli government wanted to put some safeguards that the company will not be bought by foreign agents because this is a very important company producing ammunition and, and other weapons for the Israeli military. What happens if it's somehow bought by some kind of foreign country that will then shut it down or, or move it to another country. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they want to attract uh, potential buyers, so they try to make the company more uh, attractive. And what actually happened during these five years is that the price of the company became negative. They actually sold the company IMI for less than zero dollars. If you count all of the money that the government had invested into IMI to make it in, uh, attractive for Elbit Systems, Elbit Systems is going to pay about uh, 600 million dollars altogether including when they pay back the loan uh, but the Israeli government has already really paid more than that especially to compensate workers that are going to lose their jobs in terms of pensions and, and uh, various uh, benefits and bonuses uh, to get the union to sign to agree to the privatization so that was a very long process nevertheless two years ago uh, they, they were very close to signing a deal with Elbit Systems, uh, uh, but then they hired a company to assess the value of IMI. 
uh, to create uh, an estimate of its value. But as you always have with privatization, they hired a private company to do that. And it became apparent that this private company that the Israeli Ministry of Finance hired is actually a subsidiary of Elbit, the bidder for the company. So that created an impossible situation. As soon as that uh, was, was revealed, they had to stop the sale because it would have been incredibly corrupt. Uh, and they had to find another assessing company that created further delays. All right, now tell us about uh, LBIT system and what kind of company is it? And, um, and what kind of company is IMI now? Elbit Systems is a very fast-growing uh, arms company. It became uh, the second biggest arms company in Israel uh, and the biggest private arms company in Israel. And in fact, uh, the biggest arms company in Israel, AI, uh, Israeli Aerospace Industries, uh, is, is owned by the government, but it's actually, it also has a civilian department to it. If you disregard the civilian department, that makes Elbit the biggest arms company in Israel. And, and they're actually driving forward the whole idea of privatization of security in Israel more than any other company. They are uh, working in very close association with American arms companies, because what, what Elbit specializes in is in modules or technologies that fit into US produced weapons. For example, they produced uh, optical systems that are then installed in drones produced by other companies, or they produce um, helmets that are worn by pilots of uh, uh, fighter planes produced in the United States. So there's a kind of symbiosis there. And that, and, and Elbit uh, tries to uh, brand itself as a kind of high tech company producing cutting edge technology. In fact, they're extremely dependent on, on US companies and, and work with them. And the way that they, uh, the, their business model is to constantly go in deeper and deeper into debt and buy more and more companies. That's why they're buying IMI. IMI uh, is a, a very different kind of company. It's a very old and traditional company. It's quite famous for building the infamous um, Uzi submachine gun, which was uh, um, at, at some point used by the Israeli military forces. I think there's not been a single Uzi machine gun produced in, uh, by IMI in the last 30 years now. Uh, the, the Uzis are produced in China, if, if at all. Uh, but uh, but IMI uh, also have a few of these sort of high-tech high uh, technologies, but most of their products are very down-to-earth and very unexciting, things like ammunition. Uh, and actually, these things like ammunition or engines for rockets are things that are quite essential for the Israeli military. And so Elbit understands that by buying uh, IMI, they're going to, to control the market. They're going to have a supply chain. Uh, and uh, that's also the reason that they're the only bidder. Because any other company that thought maybe we should buy IMI, but then we're going to come into direct com uh, competition with Elbit. The only company that wouldn't is Elbit Systems itself. And the biggest customer of Elbit Systems and the biggest customer of IMI is the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Now Elbit Systems is going to control that market. Uh, and the fact that they asked that a quarter of the sale price would be in the form of a loan means that they still need more cash because they're planning further purchases down the road. Right. And Shira, what does this merger mean for sales of Israeli weapons to the rest of the world? I mean, uh, Israel does a lot of uh, sales of weapons. Um, so what does it mean? Yeah, uh, well, both IMI and Elbit have one thing in common. They don't uh, reveal the full extent of their customers because uh, um, after there was an appeal to the Israeli Supreme Court, it was revealed that uh, Israel is selling weapons to 160 countries around the world. I should emphasize there are no 160 democracies in the world. There are also no 160 countries in the world that have diplomatic relations with Israel. They're selling weapons virtually to anyone who would pay for them. And um, one of the things that Israeli uh, arms companies constantly complain about, and they keep on going to the press with these complaints, is that why are we competing against each other? Why are uh, different Israeli arms companies uh, trying to outbid each other in international uh, contracts? Shouldn't we merge and, and get the, uh, just one bid and, and then win more contracts for the Israeli arms industry as a whole. This is, of course, an idea which is completely contrary to the idea of, of a capitalist com a competition. Uh, but um, uh, this is exactly what's going to happen when Elbit is now able to not only produce drones 
in terms of their electronic and optical systems, but also uh, equip them with the um, propulsion system that, that is produced by IMI. So they're going to be a much bigger player in the global uh, arms, arms trade, and uh, that is probably going to increase Israel's overall arms exports, especially to areas of conflict. And of course, uh, the big question is, uh, what does this merger mean uh, for the Israeli security policies and the regular attacks they carry out on Palestinians in the occupied territory and, of course, neighboring countries as well? I mean, drones are one, but uh, there are a lot of other equipment um, in the territories and in bordering countries. So what does it mean? Yeah, we have to talk about artillery because both Elbit systems and the IMI produce artillery. And in the last attack on Gaza, or the, the last large attack on Gaza of 2014, uh, Israeli forces used heavy artillery against a civilian neighborhood, killing hundreds of people uh, in, in a very indiscriminate way. And uh, after every attack on Gaza, ever since 2006, there's immediately an arms fair held in Israel, where the Israeli arms companies show their wares. And, and, and their main marketing technique is to say, our technology, our weapons have already been tested in battle, and tested against actual human beings, tested on Palestinians. So that gives them an advantage when they're competing with international companies, because not every country in the world has their own backyard uh, where they can test their weapons on human subjects. And, and that kind of uh, advantage made a lot of uh, scholars and, and journalists uh, speculate that the Israeli attacks on Gaza and also on, on cities in the West Bank and on Lebanon are motivated partially by business uh, interests because these arms companies, they want uh, to be able to show that they've tested their weapons. So they have an economic interest that the Israeli army will attack. And I think... Uh, one of the flaws of this argument, what, one of the things that make it not very convincing is the fact that the biggest arms companies in Israel used to be state-owned. And why would a state-owned company influence government policy in order to increase its profits? Because increasing profits is not uh, such an important thing for a state-owned company. Elbit Systems changes that because it's a purely private company. They're only interested in making as much profit as possible. Uh, uh, in fact, the owner of Elbit Systems, uh, uh, Federman, is, is closely uh, related to uh, Israeli politicians, especially to Ehud Barak, uh, who used to be the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense. Uh, so he has some influence with them. And now that he's going to have such a big uh, uh, company and such a monopoly, uh, it is possible that, that um, when he sees his sales going down, he will ask uh, for a specific kind of weapon or system to be tested uh, on, on behalf of his company by the Israeli military. Uh, and that's, of course, something that we should all be worried about because it really turns war into a business uh, and into profit-making business. But there's also a silver lining, and I would like maybe to, to end on that point of the silver lining, because um, by becoming this big monopoly, uh, and the main customer, as I've said, is the Israeli Ministry of Defense, Elbit Systems will now control 80% of the market for the Israeli uh, land forces, the, all, all of the military, the artillery, the, the armor divisions, all of their supplies, 80% will be controlled by, by Elbit Systems, and that means that the prices are going to go up. The Israeli defense budget is already stretched because a lot of people uh, in Israel realize that there is a direct conflict between the standard of living and the defense budget. And uh, defense spending comes at the expense of, of people's uh, um, quality of life. So uh, this means that every bullet, every ca uh, cannon sh uh, uh, shell, uh, every uh, uh, rocket is going to cost more to the Israeli army to use because uh, of this monopoly situation. So actually, there is a chance that the Israeli military will have to ration the use of its violence just a little bit more uh, because uh, it will have to buy all of its weapons from one customer, from one supplier. And, and Shir, finally, um, if there are so many exports to uh, other countries in terms of uh, weapons, um, did the public treasury uh, in Israel depend on these uh, exports and the revenue generated from that for its own public spending? And will that be affected by this sale? Uh, well, this, this is a very difficult question to answer because uh, we don't know all the facts, because uh, the, many of these sales are, are hidden. 
uh, and and uh, when when the Israeli government is selling weapons to countries uh, like uh, Rwanda or like um, uh, Nigeria or like Uganda, uh, these deals are kept secret, and we only hear about them indirectly. Nevertheless, we can estimate that about 11% of all Israeli exports are arms exports. 11% is more than any other country in the world. There is no country in the world that 11% of their exports are military exports. But on the other side of this, 89% of the exports are not military related. So we have to look at this in the right proportion. Uh, so I wouldn't say that the Israeli Ministry of Finance depends on that income. Another problem is that the Israeli Ministry of Defense has a lot of autonomy. And the revenue generated from arms exports doesn't go directly to the Israeli Ministry of Finance uh, or even to the companies, but is rather controlled and managed by the Ministry of Defense. And the Ministry of Defense has a very free hand to use that revenue to finance uh, research into new weapons and things like that, uh, or to buy expensive weapon systems. So in fact, uh, this makes the Israeli Ministry of Finance uh, very uh, weak in its ability to influence how that uh, revenue money is used and, and very little of that money actually gets into the Israeli economy and into people's uh, quality of life. All right, Shir, we'll leave it there for now. And I thank you so much for joining us. A very interesting uh, story of privatization. And uh, I thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sharmini. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.